Cartoonist Kayfabe ringside seats for this month's new comic book day night live starring Tom Scioli. What's up, everyone? Thank you all so much for joining us on this glorious new comic book day where we are featuring one single new comic book, and that is Star Warriors featuring Adam Star and the Solar Legion, an amazing new comic reimagining a classic Jack Kirby comic from Crash Comics number one through three, which we are going to check out as well. So welcome everyone. And we're going to start this week like we start every or start every month saying hello to our hosts and getting a little bit of those plugs out of the way. So we're going to start with Rick Lopez. What up, homie? Hey, all Rick Lopez. Uh, you can find me on Instagram at Doom Dazed. Still plugging away on a six-page story coming up for someone else's book, but I'm always pumping the power. It's a four-issue series. It's about a boy creating a comic, only to discover a realm beyond space and time within his own mind. So I got that coming out always. I'm down to my last five copies of my second printing of issue one. So I'll be doing a third printing before before here pretty soon. Uh, always working on Cosmic Cat over on Next Panel Press. If you want to read a bunch of free comics on Next Panel Press, uh, we have over a dozen different artists. You can go through our story, uh, our story history, and you could read all of our different uh, comics for free. And then uh, find me. Me and Manny did a six-page backup for Adam Lenda's book, Relic Hunter, as well. You can find that um, from Cosmic Lion Productions. Back to you, Manny. Well, I mean, I've been uh, doing uh, more weekly episodes of the Comic Lounge with Ryan. We've been doing uh, a, a couple of episodes on new stuff. And then uh, we're going to do a bunch of horror comics uh, now for Halloween. So we've been getting books together for that. Uh, like Rick said, I wrote a story that he drew for Adam Lemna's uh, Relic Hunter, and I'm also uh, co-writing Relic Hunter with Adam starting with issue two. Some of those pages have been serialized on Next Panel Press, which features a bunch of other dudes that are uh, on this uh, podcast right now, too, so great, great, uh, great collective there. And uh, you can find my writing at monkeysfightingrobots.com. Word. Back to you, you Eli. Sir. And of course, you can find me and a galaxy of comics on CosmicLionProductions.com, uh, including we are uh, importing the glorious book, The Makers, from Dave Howlett, who's here in the, in the group right now. Think uh, Galaxy Quest meets the original uh, image creators. Dave, is that, was that a good pitch? That's a great pitch, Eli. I love it. Uh, I don't always like to use the this meets that, but that one is too good to, to pass up. So <laughs> it's one through pitch. six for only 20 bucks are on CosmicClientProductions.com right now for that. We got a brand new book called The Original Comic I Ever Bought that I specced on when I was a kid. Uh, these guys have a new book, Parafrenetic, and it's uh, the, the pre-orders just ended quote unquote, but it's still available on uh, CosmicLionProductions.com. I'm working on a ton of new stuff. I just met up with an 80s creator, one of my favorite 80s creators, and he found something in the annals of his stuff that I might be able to publish. I'm speaking out of class here, but uh, we'll see what happens with that. I'm super excited, and uh, there's just more always coming from Cosmic Lion Productions. Stay tuned. All right, let's get out of there. Let's get out of the, the plug hole and uh, plug our holes with these comic book ideals. So our special guest today is Tom Scioli. As you all know, he's got this brand new book and um, it is it is a re remixing of a super early Jack Kirby comic that when he was like 22 years old. Let's throw it over to Tom. Give us a little bit of uh, a primer for uh, this new book. Yeah, it's uh, one of Jack Kirby's first comic books. He, um, prior to this, he did uh, some comic strips, but uh, this is one of his first comic books. It's his first sci-fi comic book. He wrote and drew it uh, and inked it as well um, and uh, possibly lettered it too. It looks like his lettering. And it was just really, really early. And it had so many Jack Kirby trademarks in it. 
it's um, you know sort of like a cosmic hero along the lines of like a Flash Gordon or Buck Rogers, um, and it's got Jack Kirby's first alien. It's got Jack Kirby's first monster. It's um, you know it's it's it it's it breaks a lot of ground for Jack Kirby, and it's just like a really strong comic in its own right. It's just uh, you know just kind of lost in the annals of time and. Uh, when I was, you know, look, spending a lot of time in the golden age working on Jack Kirby, the Epic Life of the King of Comics, and more recently, I Am Stan, I just, uh, you know, came back to that story, and I'd, I'd read it a few times before, and it didn't really register with me, but, like, this time around, I was just sort of taking in the visuals, taking in the words, and it just felt so epic, so amazing, and so akin to Jack Kirby's later work, the stuff he's, you know, more widely known for. And I thought, you know what, with just like a couple of like small adjustments, this could be like one of the greatest Jack Kirby comics ever. And so I wanted to see what that looked like. And so I, I you know, played around with it and then here it is. And I contacted Image Comics and they, they were like, yeah, let's do it. They said, yes, the same day I contacted uh, Jack Kirby's family. I talked to Lisa Kirby, and uh, she was all for it. So you know, here it is. That's so amazing. Now I'm going to share my screen here for a second. We have the comics. I guess are in the um, in the public domain at this point. Is that true? Right. Yeah. It's a it's a public domain comic. There's there's some other Kirby comics from that era, and some Simon and Kirby comics from that era that are also uh, in the public domain. So you you looked at these and you were just like, oh my god. Okay, so this is his first monster right here. This like, I mean, it oh no, it shows one. up in it shows up in the. I mean, unless you count um, there, uh, when you go one more page over, like, uh, if you go one page after this, there's like, yeah. So um, let's see, maybe it showed up a couple of uh, the page before, but there's this like swamp monster. I'm trying to find him. Oh yeah, there he is. Yeah, he's oh. at the bottom. Yeah. Oh, so that's that swamp monster. That's the first Kirby monster. Those uh, fishmen are the first Kirby aliens. Mm -hmm. And then yeah, when you turn the page, uh, it's the same issue, but it's kind of you know. So it's it it's kind of Jack's second monster, but it's in the same issue. Is that amazing worm creature? Oh, like I just couldn't so believe cool. it when I you know saw that. And like you you captured the utter grossness of this uh, pox mark hairy worm thing going on so yeah it's got all these like sort of flagella on it uh, really you know really kind of terrifying like th these comics are pretty intense uh yeah. they're very violent uh very raw like like his the stuff he did shortly after this was a lot more sort of like toned down a lot more you know g-rated or pg-rated but this is uh, you know, pr pretty strong stuff. Yeah, agreed. Oh, geez. Okay, there we go. All right, cool. All right, great. I just wanted to give everyone a little bit of a taste of the original books there so that when you get this book and you see it, you see how much creativity you brought into it and, and this reimagining of taking like full pages and just turning like two panels into a new full page or flipping stuff around, adding some uh, influence and some stuff on these different say, different you know, pages. All right, cool. So let's go over to Manny and uh, we'll start the question portion. What's up, buddy? What's up? Anyway, Tom, um, you also had uh, another book come out recently. You had I Understand, which came out uh, last week. And uh, it's, uh, you know, it's your it's your uh, autobiography on um, Stan Lee, like the one you did on Jack Kirby. So I, I wanted to ask you a couple of questions about uh, this one. For once, uh, for one, uh, did you have to do? Um, was your research for this different than the one for Kirby? Sure, I mean, I mean such, there, such a public. Yeah, there figure. was some. Yeah, there was some crossover, like, like okay, just to do the Jack Kirby book, I had to do a lot of research into Stan Lee, you know, for his portion, and you know, more, you know, more stuff than what ended up in the Jack Kirby book. So I already sort of had a pretty strong start, but yeah, when when it was, you know, when I finally sort of committed to doing, you know, another comics biography.
your fee and 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 committed to doing to doing stand story and then like the real you know diving into things really started and, and went really deep and and again that's like talking about like the solar legion stuff it was like i was i was looking at you know as much of the things that passed through stan's office as possible so i was looking at all kinds of like golden age comics and stuff that i'd never seen before some of it like the um the sort of uh you know funny romance kind of comics the uh sort of um you know he just ha had done sort of every imaginable genre whether as editor or editor writer um you know just uh you know ziggy pig and uh there was like a uh, he did a bunch of like Blondie and Dagwood kind of pastiches. Oh, Tom, we lost your mic there, dude. Or we can't hear Oh, you me. lost my mic. Am I still oh, there? Now you're back. Now, <laughs> okay. So, oh. yeah. Yeah. I lost you guys for a minute there, too. Okay. Rewind maybe a sentence or something. <laughs> yeah, sure. I mean, just, uh, you know, I spent a lot of time checking out these Stan Lee comics that I just never you know, I'd never seen before, never checked out before, because there's kind of that, you know, weird era of like the 40s and 50s, you know, like, like some of the superhero stuff, like, like his return to uh, when he brought back Captain America and some of like the early Captain America stuff that Stan worked on after Jack and Joe left. Like I was, I, I was fully acquainted with that stuff, but there's all kinds of just weird, like, um, you know, Blondie and Dagwood pastiches and, and just the kind of stuff that a, you know, comics fan or like a superhero fan wouldn't really you know go seeking out unless you're telling the story of stan lee's life i mean i think it's also interesting like it seems like these three projects also are, are kind of connected in a way where it's like you know you did the kirby book which led to the led to the adam star book but when you started the kirby book did you ever think you were going to do a, a stan lee book too or was that just some you know like i mean working on the jack kirby book I was aware of the possibility that like, if I'm not careful, this could turn into a Stan Lee book. Stan Lee is a oh, very interesting. big personality yeah. and kind of, um, you know, it's like it, when Stan Lee shows up, is the reader going to be like, oh, I want to see what this guy's up to, you know? So, so there was, I was aware of that. Like I kind of, I knew that Stan Lee is, is this, uh, you know, just very magnetic figure and, and somebody that people are um, just genuinely interested right off the bat. A lot of people where Jack Kirby, some people are like, I, I don't even know who Jack Kirby is. Um, but I, the Jack Kirby story, it just made more sense for me to start there. I, I feel like if I started okay, yeah. with a Stan Lee book, it might've been like, hmm, you know, uh, you know, why is Tom doing a Stan Lee book? But when I did a Jack Kirby book, I felt like that made sense. And then after I'd done the Jack Kirby book, the, the Stan Lee was almost a no-brainer. Cool, man. That's it. I mean, I guess I'll pass it over to Rick now. All right. Uh, what up, Rick? Hey, Tom. Thanks again for your time, dude. I really appreciate you coming on, man. I'm, I'm curious, though, since we're on the topic of I Am Stan, like, was it, because um, I don't know what kind of, first of all, uh, I don't know what kind of loops or anything you had to deal with trying to do uh, the Kirby book first off. And I'm curious how different it was dealing with Stan, if it was more of a pain in the ass for less of a better term. Yeah, I mean, there's there's just more material there. Stan lived a very long life. I mean, right. he, he outlived Kirby by something like 20 years, you know, like in terms of age, 20 years. Uh, and just... Uh, you know, closer to 30 years in terms of just, you know, what, you know, dates. But um, so there was just so much material uh, there. And then also he was incredibly prolific in terms of uh, interviews and video. There's a lot of Jack Kirby stuff out there, kind of, kind of a surprisingly large amount, uh, considering he didn't court the spotlight quite the same way that that Stan like directly sought it. But yeah, there was just so much stuff to go through with Stan Lee. It, it's um, you know, just way more ground to cover. I'm, I'm curious, look, well, cause um, so I don't know any of like uh, what I mean to say is the loops you had to go through just to make, just to make a book about somebody else's life. Like if you have any sort of pushback or anything from anybody, or do you just like, 
you're just able to make it. And if they, if they have, uh, if you have their blessing, you have it. And if you don't, you don't. Yeah, that's pretty much it. I mean, you're, you're, you know, within okay. your rights to tell the story of, of anybody's life, uh, you know, like a, a public figure particularly, but yeah, you, you are, you know, within your rights to tell that story. And then it's, uh, you know, that other stuff is, is really up to you. You don't necessarily need any kind of, you know, clearances or agreements. I mean, when you tell the story of somebody's life, uh, you know, if they're still alive, you know, they're probably going to have something to say about it. Um, right. You know, and then, and then some of the people who show up might have something to say about it. So, you, you know, there's, there's that, but, but yeah, there's really nothing stopping you from doing a, a book about pretty much anybody. Okay. Well, hopefully you haven't dealt with too much shit from people, I guess, because. No, not at all. Yeah. I haven't heard any, like I did the Jack Kirby book and I didn't hear anything uh, negative from any, you know, any of the, the family or any of the people in it. And the, the Stan Lee book's pretty new. So I haven't heard that much, you know, either way. Mm. Uh, but, but yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. Okay. Okay. I'll leave that at my first question for now, but thank you, Tom. Appreciate it. Sure. All right, we'll do one more round of host cues and then we'll take it out to the audience of which the queue is already queuing. Um, I'd like to talk about Godland with you a little bit, Tom. This is my entrance to your work. I loved it. I thought it was this amazing, like, sorry, is. I think it is this amazing psychedelic action thing. I love Joe Casey's storytelling as well. So I, I just am interested about how, how it was working with Joe and then what... Uh, or what kind of creative freedom were you given did you do character character designs did you and joe work together and uh just how did you and i guess this is another thing that drew me to your work is how did you begin making kirby a genre you know and i feel like this is a a, a yoke you've worn now for a while in a incredibly positive way so how did you sure especially like the star warriors that's like the most yes. kirby thing i've done you know absolutely yeah obviously but yeah i mean it's it's funny you bring up joe casey because just by chance we both have a new image comic out the same day like his his new comic is out and um i mean he's done he's done more with image post godland than i have but it's not like you know he has something coming out every you know, every week or whatever. So it is kind of funny that it's it's almost like a uh, Joe Casey, Tom Scholey reunion uh, at, at, at Image Comics this week. But um, yeah, it was it was a lot of fun working with Joe. And yeah, it was a pretty free form um, collaboration. And we sort of had the idea of making it like, uh, you know, the, the, have the creative process be like um, the Marvel method, the fabled Marvel method, or at least our idea of what we thought or hoped the Marvel method was. I mean, you know, it's, uh, there's, there's many variations on it in, in reality. So yeah, we threw a lot of stuff back and forth. Um, Eric Larson kind of put us together, you know, um, you know, I was, I, I, Eric was helping me kind of like retool the myth of eight opus to kind of be like, like an image comic. And at the same time, uh, Joe Casey was talking to Eric and talking about how he wanted to kind of do something Kirby-esque. So Eric was kind of like, you know what, I should really put these two guys together and, you know, see, see what they come up with. And so, and that was kind of a first for Image because usually Image, they just kind of sit back and let, you know, the people sort of come to them with like a fully formed comic or pitch or whatever. So that was kind of a first. And yeah, we just had a bunch of phone calls back and forth, a bunch of emails and things and and i was just dumping like all my sketchbooks into it like how about this guy how about this guy you know and and by the end of it we had a, an issue of godland yeah was basil cronus one of those characters from your I yeah that was one of the characters i had this yeah guy with a uh <laughs> sort of you know fishbowl helmet with like the skull kind of free floating in there and so yeah who enjoys that ended up in there. sprinkling drugs into his uh floating head area i always thought that was just great man that was a book yeah that stuff came had, later but yeah yeah <laughs> i had to rebuy it because that was a book that i that i was con continually buying and giving to people because I, I like thought it was so great you know so i rebought it today to dive back in 
All right. Thank you so much, Tom. All right. We're going to go back to Manny. What up, dude? All right, Tom. So you've done Jack Kirby. You've done Stan Lee. Is there, is there uh, any other creator that you think you'd want to attempt to do another biography on or any other period in, in comics or, or anything, in, you know, and even if it's outside of comics? I mean, you seem to have a, a pretty good knack for the, for the genre. Well, um, in terms of like outside comics, I always wanted to do a graphic biography of Robin Williams. That was somebody whose story, oh, wow, like, cool. especially like with, with Stan Lee, it was kind of like, you know, after, after his death, I, you know, I kind of, you know, was thinking about him a lot and stuff. And it was kind of the same thing with Robin Williams. Like when Robin Williams died, I kind of ha had him on my mind and he what just like, just like Stan Lee and, and, and Jack Kirby, like Robin Williams was kind of this big figure in my life, like very early on, but like as, as a kid, seeing him on TV and stuff, and then kind of, you know, kind of took him for granted as time went on and then kind of realized like, oh yeah, that was, you know, that, that guy really like meant something at like various points in my life. So I, and, and I, like, I think he's got an interesting story. So that's somebody like just outside of the realm of comics, but in comics, yeah, there's just like a never ending supply. Steve Ditko is like an obvious one that, you know, yeah. people have brought up and that, that, you know, I, I thought about and uh, Otto Binder is somebody I, I thought would be interesting to do a book about, um, you know, there's just a bunch and, and yeah, there's, uh, you can even just like sort of focus in a decade because the forties, the thirties, they're, they're excited. And then the fifties, you have the Wortham stuff. Uh, and then the eighties was like a very interesting period the nineties, obviously. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's just, you know, you name it. That's it. Sorry, I'm talking all muted. I say you're always so mysterious at the ending, man. You just like, you're like a fade to black. Taking it all in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, let's head over back to Rick. What up, Rick? And then we will start at the beginning of the queue. Hey, Tom. Thanks again. Hey. Um, okay, so I have a bunch of different ones. So if correct me if I'm wrong, you went up and you met, you did meet Steve Ditko, didn't you? I did. Yeah, I met Stan also. Can you tell me about Steve Ditko, about that, about how that all went and the creation of your story for it? Yeah, I just, um, I just kind of showed up at his studio in New York. It was, um, you know, there was, uh, there was a, a point where me and Ed Pisker were in Brooklyn for a comic shop appearance. And we, and we were talking about like, oh yeah, we should maybe try to see if we can meet Steve Ditko, show up at his place and stuff. And we had, we had like the information from Michelle Fife, who, who'd, um, you know, uh, he'd kind of had correspondence with, with Ditko and stuff. And so we thought about, it, and then it just, it just ended up not happening. And then maybe like a year later or something, I was, I was in, uh, in Brooklyn again, and I had like a free day, like, like nothing to do. And I thought now's the time. It, let, let me go you know, knock on Steve Ditko's door the way you hear about people doing, there's all these like stories of people saying like, oh yeah, you just knock on his door and he, he gives you comics and you talk to him and stuff. So I, so that's, I thought like, yeah, let me, let me do that. And so I did, I showed up, knocked on his door and he just kind of like, uh, you know, just before I could even say anything, he just went like this and then like kind of shut the door be behind him and started walking down the <laughs> hallway. And I thought, oh, okay. Is he like taking me to the, you know, the Sanctum Sanctorum or something like, and then I, st I started kind of, uh, you know, walking behind him and then he like turned, uh, entered the door and then started walking up the stairwell. And that's when I realized, oh, he's, he's getting the fuck out of here. He's like, you know, he's like, uh, you know, Scooby-Doo or something like, you know, get, getting away from, it. and it was like, you know, all these stories of people like showing up and, and, and meeting him and talking to him, um, you know, they had sort of made that movie uh, about that documentary with uh, uh, Neil Gaiman uh, was in it and stuff, and and they did it. So I think like after that documentary, he probably got a lot more traffic uh, at his studio than he probably would have liked. So I think I I you know might have been caught up in in that. But in any case, I I felt like I got the uh, Steve Ditko um, experience 
uh, just this, this, I, this, you know, uh, I, it, it was a very like Steve Ditka moment. And I, I was kind of embarrassed, like after I, I thought like, what was I thinking? But, you know, in the years since I've kind of been like, no, you know, I, I you know, gave it my shot. It was kind of cool meeting, you know, to, to have like, you know, that, that, that moment. I would have regretted it, uh, you know, right. after he died, I, I would have regretted it being like, you know what, I was in town. I should have just, you know, given it a try. So I did how long after did you because you did a strip for it too didn't you yeah yeah there was um yeah maybe like a year or two after that there was um this uh i think it was like a german magazine or something and they asked That's me right. like you know to do a comic for it and they said it can be about anything it can be about anything and i thought like you know i kind of i kind of want to get that moment out of my system kind of do that so i did that story and then they were kind of like we don't understand what's going on here. I'm like, well, you did tell me, you know, anything. So, so I did it and, and uh, you know, it, it, it got a great reaction. Like people really s seem to be into it. I, I, I should do like an English translation of it. No, some, totally. I mean, I, I, you know, I did it in English to begin with and then they translated it. So. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. Like uh, last September I had a similar, a similar experience. Uh, Grant Morrison came to do a live talk in LA and they allowed us the chance to raise our hands and everything and they picked so many people you know whatever but at the end of the show they're filing us out of there and i'm like looking around i hop the stage and i go to the back and i was able to meet grant and like give him my books and everything and it was like such a fucking experience like i turned the corner and like everything was black but there was like a door open in his silhouette with like a blue light it was like <laughs> fucking yeah. perfect like ominous shit <laughs> and afterwards I, rick came out Somehow his hat and hair was off and he was glistening. His hair was <laughs> flying in the air somehow. He was glowing golden. He was the most coolest person at that moment. I knew you had to have a, a very funny, similar experience too. So I just I just had to hear it firsthand. But thank you for that one, Tom. I know I have, yeah, sure. I have more. Appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool. All right, so we are going to go. Let's see. Let's go to... Our first person in line, that is the tough stuff himself, Mr. Kevin Delgado. Ooh, the heat's on. Hi, Tom. He hey, how you doing? Home. Real good. Um, <laughs> quick question. Um, while doing like all the research for, um, you know, the Jack Kirby book and the Stan Lee book, was there anything that you wanted to include in the book that you just couldn't, that was like, you kind of regret leaving out? No, not regret. I mean, there's some things that you have to kind of leave out just because you just don't know for sure. You know, like there's this line you have to walk of like some of this stuff is um, kind of, you know, debated and up in the air. So there there are some things you kind of have to leave out. And then there's some things you have to leave out because it's like, oh, you know, like these are real people and stuff. And so, you don't, you know, you kind of have to, you know, you have to, you have to you know, be careful, you know, what you say and you know there there's like a team of lawyers that like to look it over and you know make sure like you know every everything's you know being done right so is there like a sweet tidbit of juicy info that you can pass along to us yeah no i mean if, i mean if they if there's something i i regret leaving out uh in the stan lee book i i would have liked to have you know done some things with how to draw comics the marvel way it just it just kind of didn't you know, it, it never found a place in the book, but like that book was so important to me personally. Uh, so like looking back, it's like, uh, you know, I, I wish I had a little, maybe a little more time to kind of figure out some way of, of making that sort of make narrative sense. And then um, the other thing would be for Jack Kirby. Again, sometimes I would think of like, oh man, I wish I would have had this scene or this scene. And then I go back and look at the book and I actually did that. I just forgot that I didn't do it. But there's this one scene in Jack Kirby's life that I I, I didn't manage to fit in that like looking back, it's like, oh man, I, I totally wish I had was there was this like time when, you know, he was like an old man and he was telling some, you know, one of his war stories at dinner. And then there was this other guy like around the same age who started getting like real angry and the guy was like speaking German and stuff like that. And so like, it looked like, you know, like uh 70 year old Jack Kirby was gonna get 
in like a fist fight with this other 70 year old guy who might have been, you know, on the other side in World War II. So like, that's a pretty amazing moment. And just so, you know, if I had it to do a ride, I, 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 you know, find a, find a spot for that. Ooh, thank you. Sure. Dang, that sounds, that sounds like an amazing story. All right, we got the man himself, the the scratchiest artist in the room, the man himself, Tony McMills. Hey, Tom, how are you doing? Hey, Tony. Um, so reading your stuff, I think you're really good at um, kind of dark, tragic endings in a lot of your books. And reading I Am Stan, I thought it was like, this is like the best one yet. I'm wondering, like, when I say dark tragic ending, like the Fantastic Four book kind of ends on a kind of, there's, there's a moment of hope at the end with the time travel element, but it is kind of a dark, somber note. And I thought uh, GoBots had a thing like that. And um, uh, I think I Am Stan was like, really hit me hard. Do you view these endings as um, dark or tragic? Like, like I Am Stan, is, there's tons of funny stuff. Stanley's a very, you know, loquacious, funny person, but um. I kind of thought the whole book almost felt like a Greek tragedy in a weird way. <laughs> is that like, am I, is it too, am I making it too heavy? Do you feel like these books have dark endings and stuff? I mean, I, I kind of like tell it like it is. And that's just, you know, kind of where these stories, you know, it's like, where do you cut the story off? If, if I had cut the story of Stan Lee's life off at like, you know, the premiere of Spider-Man the movie or something, you know, like it's a different kind of story, but it's, it's like, the story of Stan Lee is an opened and closed book. The story of Jack Kirby is an open and closed book. And there is, I mean, I, I keep going back to this Jack Kirby quote from uh, issue 18 of Mr. Miracle, but life at best is bittersweet. Like that, it just, um, you know, it, 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 it just feels genuine. But I mean, that's just the way those stories have played out. I've, I've um, and again, like, I, I, I really, I'm really happy with the the way the Stan Lee book ends, and I think there's you know there's there's a beauty to it also. So, same with Gobots, like there's there's some darkness, but then there's also you know like a moment of of sort of you know quiet reflection, and and the 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 place where uh, you know Turbo of the Gobots goes is to this like very happy memory of sort of sort of the golden the golden age but but no I, I i get what you're saying for sure and, and real quick there's a real quick question I, i've always wondered this i my favorite work of yours is definitely transformers versus j.i joe's it like it kind of changed my whole world um i think early on in some of the back commentary it sounded like you were talking like the series that like was going to be an ongoing series was it going to be ongoing at some point or is that kind of nebulous or no it was always meant to be you know like a finite thing like I, you know, I was shooting for like around 12 issues, you know, like a Watchmen kind of thing. I think it ended up being like 14 or, or 15, but no, it was, it was always planned to be a finite thing. It's just when it's coming out, you kind of, um, you know, you kind of frame it as an ongoing, you know, just kind of, um, just, I, I think it makes like business sense to frame it as an ongoing, even if, uh, you know, you do have a fin finite thing in, in mind, but I also, I let that story go wherever it was going to go. Like I was very, it was a very open creative process. So I thought, you know what, if I reach the end of this and I, I want to keep it going, I'll keep it going, you know, but, but the plan was always to kind of, um, you know, sort of, uh, you know, do like a mic drop at, at the end. And I, I kind of plotted it out that way, but, um, and, and looking back, I mean, I'm really like, I'm so happy with like the shape of it. And it's it's sort of finite nature, but I was kind of, you know, the the year like after I finished uh, Transformers versus GI Joe, I did have kind of almost a year before like I got anything else going again, you know, before Superpower. So like looking back, it's like oh gee, I probably should like just for something to do, I probably should have kept it going. And like the offer was there to keep it going, but I just I want I wanted it to be its own thing. I've seen. Like, um, you know, on, on the Total Recall show, I've been reading through the Micronauts. I got, and the first 12 issues of Micronauts is so great. And if it would have sort of stopped there, it would have been this amazing graphic novel, this kind of, you know, legendary kind of like, you know, a, along the lines of like a Watchmen. But because they kept it going, it kind of becomes just another comic. And you sort of, 
you know, undercut, you know, the, the, the shape of it. And, and, and so I, I never, like, I didn't want to end up there. So like American Barbarian, you know, it was, I just wanted it to be like this thing and then, and then end it. No, no sequel, no. And, and, and this was the same way. And there's, there's a bunch of comics that are like that, where they have this like really great, um, you know, opening arc or whatever. And then they keep going and going and almost become like a joke the longer they go on. Thanks, Tom. That was an awesome answer. I really appreciate both those things. Uh, another great thing about this group is that everyone who comes on mic has a killer book of their own. So I'm going to be putting all those links in the chat. You got to check out Tony's book, Serious Creatures. It is absolutely amazing. I don't know if you've seen it, Tom, but it's, kill it's killer. Thank you, Tony. All right. Next up, we got the Relic Hunter himself, the editor in chief of editing <laughs> movies we got adam lemna what up buddy hey guys hey tom really nice to uh get a chance to talk to you um just a quick question that i had um i've worked on a lot of documentaries i know that you really try to you know not have preconceived notions about the characters that you're trying to research even if you do but everybody does have preconceived notions and oftentimes along the way those get challenged in like a million different ways like for example i've spent many years researching jack parsons because i want to make a film about his contribution to the zeitgeist and to you know rocketry and all this different stuff but so many times you get challenged when you're reading about somebody's life like that because there are so many different people during their lives and so when you were looking into jack and into and into stanley did you have like any moments where your preconceived notions were challenged and if so what were those moments and did they make it into the book or did that like change the way that you were going to approach anything in the book well, I, I mean, I, I like that you brought up documentaries because that was like going, making the Stan Lee book. That was sort of my thought was that I'm going to make a documentary. Um, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yeah, yeah that, that I was going to make a documentary. And I, I was thinking of, um, you know, just sort of, th there's there's like a palette of of tools at your disposal when you're, doing documentary storytelling as opposed to like sort of traditional comic storytelling. So I wanted, uh, you know, I wanted to kind of feel like, uh, you know, I'm sort of like uh, observing this stuff and kind of, you know, collating it and putting it together. Um, and, and there was um, there was this uh, um, David Bowie documentary that, that came out recently. And I, I heard the, um, I, I heard the documentarian like uh, doing an interview about it and he was, and when he was talking about it, he would like, I was like, wow, you, you know, like what he's talking about is like exactly what I was trying to do with this Stan Lee book. So, it, and, and one of the things he was talking about is just this idea that like all, all biography is autobiography. So like, I was, I, I was, I wanted to be very aware of that and kind of keep, yeah. uh, you know, sort of my story and my preconceived notions out of it. I get like, I mean, one of it wasn't necessarily a preconceived notion, but it was almost like a like a hypothesis where I went into the Stan Lee book thinking, okay, is there a Stan Lee comic or Stan Lee story or something that predates his collaboration with Jack Kirby that has, you know, as many of those like Marvel comics elements as possible? Because I thought if I could find that, that would, you know, that would be, you know, that would that would make a very strong case for a lot of the claims Stan makes about being sort of the primary author of these things and stuff. And so I was looking for that. I I didn't find that. I did find like some, uh, and and it was kind of frustrating because I I I thought I'd, I'd find something maybe like close, at least closer to that. And I didn't I didn't find uh, any sort of smoking gun that way. Um, I, I guess. Uh, trying to think of preconceived notes. I, I mean, another another thing with the Stan Lee book was I felt like in the Jack Kirby book, Jack Kirby got to sort of have his say about, you know, how he views these things and, and whatnot. And 
I wanted to do the exact same thing with Stan. Like, right. okay, let me hear your story of what you think happened with the creation of these characters. I, but the Stan Lee, like his his testimony, the the um like various like speeches that he gave where where he talked about the origins of these things, they were just so um they just felt so rote and so like just like sort of good anecdotes and not uh, you know not very truthful and and I could sort of see like because he would repeat them again and again and I could sort of see the way they got to this like shape so it, like I, I felt like it would be irresponsible to just kind of you know just kind of you know let you know uh treat treat them at face value like I right. kind of had to present present that 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 span and this and the and the context of, of how these stories were sort of developed. Thanks, man. I mean, that's that's really interesting because you know there are some. It's it would be so easy to fall into a trap with these guys. Like, you know, they're either a hero or a villain. You know what I mean? But it, there are so many shades to everybody. So thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you so much, Adam. And uh, again, I've got his link to his book, Relic Hunter in the chat which yes is on cosmiclionproductions.com but still i would have clicked it out no matter what <laughs> thanks adam all right next we got tony farrow another killer when it comes to the comic book scene who's probably got a oof maverick in the work as we speak uh unmute yourself bud and let's let's get it going um yeah okay so hey uh tom it's great to meet you sort of i've been a, a huge fan since like Myth of Eight Opus. Like I just remember buying that off the stand when I saw it. Cause I'm a, I'm a huge Kirby fan and I saw that and I was like, okay, this is exactly, exactly what I want. <laughs> um, so I've been loving your stuff forever. Um, ah. <laughs> but um, it, it, it turns out like, I mean, I, I love um, trying not to make this too long. Uh, Transformers versus GI Joe is without a doubt like i think the best comic of the 2010s or whatever decade it was that it came out i absolutely love that comic so much um but at the time i didn't buy it when it came out i didn't end up buying it until um probably almost 10 years later and the reason for, i'm sorry my, my stand is is toppling um so i'm getting to my question the reason I didn't buy that at the time is because um, I didn't understand your choice of not inking it. And like, I think it, it came out at the time when I was like, in my own artistic development, I was like really focused on, on learning how to ink properly. And so it felt like, I was like, I don't understand why anyone would not ink a comic. <laughs> and uh, And I think I read something where you addressed your your reasoning behind that and i didn't quite understand what you were getting at and i'm just wondering if you might be able to sort of expand on what what your feelings are on inking um and what you what's behind your decision to to just go straight to you know pencil and um yeah i mean yeah I, I, there, there are moments I think in artists' lives where they are like very like evangelical about ink, and I've I've had my sort of you know love story with ink. Also, I you know I spent a lot of years in the trenches in the ink trenches. I just reached a point where um, I just I I preferred the 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 uninked look so much to the inked look, and I just and I sort of like the way somebody would fall in love with with ink and brushes and and things like that i sort of you know fell in fell back in love with the pencil and um i just the, the results didn't look the way i wanted them to uh for instance um you know like like uh godland i inked traditionally with brushes and things also i reached a point where like the brushes that i used changed where they weren't um you know, they're like the Windsor Newton company, they had this sort of generation of sort of craftsmen that all sort of like retired around the same time. And so the brushes just weren't the same anymore. So 
So there was that frustration. Uh, but no, I just, um, a, an inked black line uh, needs to be tempered. Uh, to my to my taste, for, and for the way I was inking, I was inking the same way that you know Jack Kirby's inkers would have inked. I was using brushes, and I was using sort of like a thicker, a thick to thin line, like you would see from a Joe Sinnott, a Mike Royer, a Dick Ayers. And I kept getting frustrated as I'd get these uh, you know comics back from the printer, like the 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 Godland ones. I think like, why does this not look right? This doesn't look like. How come? I'm doing everything I can to make a Jack Kirby looking comic, you know, down to the mark making. Why does it not look like that? And it just took me a while to realize that, oh, when Jack Kirby was making comics and they were being inked, they weren't being printed on bright white, super smooth, glossy paper. And so they didn't have this like really like intensely crisp and defined line work. They had this kind of softer, uh, almost like sort of uh, painterly, almost, uh, you know, kind of, uh, you know, wispy kind of look to them because of the printing process. And that aesthetic is what I loved. And so if I was, if I wanted my comics to sort of look the way I wanted them to look, I was going to have to address that. And I did various things. I, I changed line colors, you know, I would ink in black and then, you know, put like a, you know, drop a, a different color in. So I did that for, um, you know, I did that towards the end of Godland, uh, I did that for um, for uh, American Barbarian. I did it for, you know, and again, it, it was it was an improvement, but it still wasn't what I was looking for. And, and what I kind of realized, and the issue zero, uh, the free comic book day issue of um, Transformers versus G.I. Joe was completely inked. It was not pencil, it was, it was inked. Um, and I would get out like a little razor blade to kind of cut up the ink lines a little bit to make them look like a little, you know, rougher around the edge is what I wanted. Uh, and then, yeah, I was drawing issue two, and I, I mean, issue one, the, the first like regular issue, and I was drawing it and inking it and stuff. And I, I just kind of reached this point where it was like, you know, this pencil looks so much better and I'm pretty sure I can scan it in, in a way and, and, and make, it, make it work. And that penciled line, because of the way, you know, graphite and a pencil kind of like breaks and shatters and on, on sort of this molecular level, it looked, even with, you know, really good scanning and really good printing, it looked, it had that sort of rough, soft focus quality of an old comic. And so I just, I was like, yeah, there, there's no way back. And, and sort of like half of issue one is inked traditionally, and then half of it is is penciled because I kind of like had that realization part of the way in there. And then from like issue two onward, it was all pencil. And um, I haven't I haven't picked up, you know, an inking implement since then. You ever think that there'll be a time that you'll you'll consider going back to it or even like digitally? Because there's a lot of stuff that well, can I mean, be done. I, yeah, I do digitally ink. Uh, it's just everything and, and I have done sort of digitally inked pieces that look like a, you know, like a liquidy ink line, but I haven't done any of it for publication yet. Those are all things I've posted uh, because again, it's like, they look fine on your screen under the right conditions, they look fine, but for some reason, it just doesn't look right to me uh, printed. So I, but, but I do like, you know, it's, it's, it's a journey, it's growth. And, you know, for now that sort of soft focus pencil look is just, um, I'm, I'm just so in love with it. But yeah, I, I, could, I could see, you know, falling in love with ink again, like, especially when I'm talking to Ed and Jim, because they're like so deep into that stuff. And like, when we're like looking at all the implements and the, the, um, the, the um, duo tone and all that kind of stuff, I do, like, there is a part of me that kind of wakes up that, that does like sort of love that kind of stuff. But um, yeah, I just, I just, you know, I'm not there yet. But for the record, I, I have turned my I, I've turned my mind around definitely. I, I absolutely love the stuff with everything that you're doing. It's it was just uh, you know it, it was jarring at first to my I didn't understand it, but it's I I I absolutely love it. I think you you know I have no uh, disagreement with your decision. I mean, not that I should because it's your fucking decision, but <laughs> you know I absolutely love it. So keep it up, man. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Tony, so much, y'all.
And I uh, linked his work again. You can check it out, rubberwolf.bigcartel.com. All right, thanks, Tony. All right, we are going off now to the mythical uh, biographer as well, who is making an amazing comic right now about Mobius. And I think you'll definitely be into it. This is James, not Westerly, James E. Easterly. You're on, buddy. Yeah, no, it, that was that was the one thing that caught me off guard when Don Simpson sent me that letter. Uh, he, he's such a jokester. <laughs> My last name is Easterly. We wrote it as Westerly, but um, <laughs> uh, yeah, for, yeah. For, first off, Tom, thanks for taking the time tonight to uh, join us and uh, chat about your comics and such. And um, three things before we, I get into my question. Um, I'm a huge Total Recall, uh, Total Recall show. Sorry. Um, say, say the your channel for me one more yeah, time. Yeah, the Total Recall show. You got yeah. a Total Recall show. Right. You're a recall head. I'm a recall head. Um, <laughs> first off, we need a playlist for the Micronauts. Um, I am excited for the wrap up uh, and continuation of the GoBot series which actually got me to reread the entire uh, collection again. And then lastly, uh, with re finding ways to revisit Empire, I think checking out the Light and Magic documentary series on Disney Plus would be a good one. And then maybe doing episodes on Star Wars video games, because we were chatting about right. Super Emperor, uh, su the Super Nintendo series of uh, Star Wars games and my difficulty as a kid trying to deal with the super empire strikes back because those are hard cause... games <laughs> yeah so I, I usually jones one yeah i usually try to let my sisters beat the games for me after a certain point like you take this for me but um getting into my question um i've absolutely adored watching your style evolve over the years and one of the things I'd be curious about you talking towards is what are some of the highlights that you enjoyed exploring your initial approach to how to codify Kirby to where you are now? How has that influenced some of the works you've been putting up on Patreon? And do you ever take offense to anyone saying, I'd like you to do this style again for a particular yeah, project. I, yeah, I mean, it was it was a really fun project to like try to get into, you know, Jack Kirby's boots, you know, to try to like learn, like, because I was, when I really, you know, started looking at his stuff closely, I, I like, I just, I I didn't know how he did it. Like, it seemed like a magic trick to me. And it was so different from, the way I'd learned how to draw and the, you know, and, and sort of traditional notions of draftsmanship. Uh, but, you know, I was just completely in awe of what he was doing with these marks and these lines and these shapes. And so, yeah, I just, you know, I, I just, you know, made, made just like a very uh, concerted effort to, you know, take it apart and put it back together again. And I really did enjoy um, that sort of phase of, my creative life of like real you know through like the myth of eight opus stuff and then the um the godland stuff and i did sort of you know after a certain point i i feel like i sort of got it out of my system like i i kind of um and, and i realized that it wasn't um it wasn't as effective uh like the comics i was making were not as effective as they could be just because um you know your brain kind of processes it as okay you know kirby but not kirby like it kind of goes through that filter which lessens its impact like like real kirby you know kind of hits you in the face but this is like um you know it's hard to do so so like what i needed to do was um you know come up with a, you know a completely different vision a way of um you know getting getting like the the, the reader to kind of you know, feel like they are looking at something completely new and in and, and a new, and, and just the, um, you know, the Jack Kirby stuff just kind of short circuited that. Um, some, sometimes I toy with the idea of revisiting that like super like Jack Kirby style, like just, just for a little couple things here and there, like I, uh, like on my Patreon, I've been doing these, uh, you know, like I, I, when I was working on superpowers, 
I just went nuts with it. And I made all kinds of DC related stuff. And I did all, and I, I created, you know, sort of some new gods comics and things that just have never been published. So my Patreon, I have, has been a way for me to kind of get this stuff out of my system and put them up there. So I have been work, you know, posting things of like, you know, my version of like an ending to new gods, um, you know, like, uh, you know, like sort of final battle between dark side and Orion. And I am sort of t tempted to maybe just like pick one of those pages and just go all in and do my best to just make like a counterfeit Kirby to just like make it seem as though it is like a lost, you know, new gods page that we'd never seen before. So, so I kind of toy with, I haven't done that yet, but I've, I've been, you know, thinking about that. Um, and I, like, I don't, um, you know, any, anytime you, you have, you know, like a long enough career, people are going to be sort of, you know, in love with this phase or this piece of work or whatever, and, and hope for more of that. It's just, uh, you know, it's kind of, and, and, and I've, I've been guilty of that too, with like some of my favorite uh, musicians, filmmakers, comics people, and just having been on this journey myself, I realized like, it's, you know, you just got to go where you're going to go. And to sort of sit down and try to like replicate something that you've done before is, um, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of a, a dead end. Um, you know, maybe it's something, you know, you can do in an afternoon, you know, for fun, but it's like, I, I just have to, you know, go where, you know, where this stuff leads me. Yeah, no, I, I really appreciate that because it, it's something that I, I try to be mindful of in terms of also as a maker that revisiting something that I did way back when I might not necessarily feel as compelled. And if I even tried, it wouldn't have the same impact as when I was in that moment, really discovering what that was. So um, I really appreciate you answering that question. And Transformers versus G.I. Joe is like one of my all-time favorite comics in my collection. So thank you for that. And also thank you again for all that you do with the Total Recall Show channel. Like that was one of the big uh, genesis points for me to really fall in love with New Gods. Because like I've, I've kind of dabbled with say the uh, animated series with Superman and things of that nature. And like, I really love that rendition of how they showed it, but you walking through the comics that really made New Gods what they are has made me fall in love with them, not just appreciate them, but truly adore them. So thank you for that. Yeah, that's awesome. That was, I mean, that was my intent because I mean, I love that stuff so much. And they, people would, uh, over the years would always ask me like, oh, what's your favorite, you know, graphic novel? Like that's usually how they phrase it. Like, what's your favorite graphic novel? And it was like, it's New God, it's Jack Kirby's New Gods, but like, I don't, like, I, I need to sort of sit there with you <laughs> to sort of give, you know, because because it just doesn't compute for people. They want something a little more like, okay, here it is, you know, beginning, like they want something like, you know, Watchmen or, or, or Mouse or, or, um, you know, Dark Knight Returns or, or, or some of the more, you know, modern classics uh, of the great, and it's like, no, there's this whole era of comics when it was something completely different and it's sprawling and messy and you don't quite get a, like, like an ending, but it's just, it, what it is, is just so beautiful and remarkable and there's, there's really nothing else like it. So, so yeah, the, these videos were like an opportunity to kind of, kind of do exactly, exactly what you say. Appreciate what you do with the channel and appreciate what you do with comics, Tom. Thanks so much, James. I put his website as well in here, easterlyart.com. Um, and I uh, can't wait for you to finish your book, dude. I'm excited. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I got Tom listed uh, for one of the copies, but that'll be uh, cool. heading to uh, Jim and Ed when, when it's ready. Sweet. Thanks, dude. All righty. We got Rocco Jerome next up, the ghost agent himself. The myth, the man, the legend with the uh, left Star Wars style um, swipe there. Whoops, wrong one here. That's what that little thing over your oh, this does perfectly is the right yeah. Star Wars <laughs> left swipe. <laughs> yeah, now now we're on Tatooine. <laughs> How about that? Perfect, dude. <laughs> um, I am a a big big fan of your work. So I'm going to try not to Eddie Haskell out on you. Um, but uh, uh, the, the thing that I wanted to ask you about is maybe something that it, it sort of goes into a kind of like a, 
demographical market research sort of thing that there might not be an answer to this question. I'll just prime it that way. Um, I uh, The guy who ran the comic shop that I used to go to a lot was an older guy. And um, he could never really quite decipher why it was that I'm so fond of your work. But he obviously loves Jack Kirby because he grew up during that time. And things would happen like the Transformers versus G.I. Joe series that I love as much as everyone here. Um, when I would get there to pick it up, he would have not your cover, but someone else's cover because he would pick his favorite. And I'd have to go over and switch them and get, get your cover instead. Um, and the way that I finally tried to sort of explain that to him, to sort of build that bridge, uh, was that I, I likened, if you think of what Jack Kirby does as being like, Chuck Berry, you're kind of like the Ramones, right? You're kind of like banging it around a little bit and seeing what happens after you, you sort of uh, 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 sort of combat test uh, the principles of Kirby. So I guess what I'm curious about is when you do shows and stuff and the people that you sort of encounter that come and talk to you, do you get a lot of people who are like Kirby type guys? Or do you just mainly get like sort of comic hipster type people like I would like to think we are? Yeah, I mean, in the beginning, it was a lot of Kirby guys because, and especially like when I started and then that it was almost like a novelty, like like uh, R. Crumb talks about this for himself where like, you know, people would meet him, you know, at, a, at an appearance or whatever and they'd be shocked at how young he was because he drew like, you know, E.C. Seeger or something. Like they assumed he must've been, you know, in, in the 1970s or whatever, they assumed he must've been some old man because, and I kind of had that too, because I was, uh, you know, you know, somebody who was like sort of, you know, much younger than the Jack Kirby era, you know, drawing like Jack Kirby. Usually you meet somebody who, who drew like Jack Kirby and they'd be like, you know, uh, 10, 20 years older, you know, than I was at the time. So, so there was, um, there was that and um yeah just um i i I'm, I'm kind of blanking a little bit on on what your question i think i might have i might be answering a different question or well something. whatever we're talking it's cool like, yeah when people come up to you like oh, do you, yeah. I, I sort of like i have a lot of friends that are older than me i'm 44 i think you're kind of in that neighborhood um but a lot of the people that i sort of am friends with are people that like older sorts of things that's kind of how mm -hmm. i'm wired um, and a lot of those guys, they're set in their ways and they kind of, something that sort of challenges their principles of, of how these things should look to them can be challenging and somewhat off-putting. And it's like, you know, they're, they, maybe they've like reached the point in their life that they're not uh, engaging with any new ideas <laughs> to put it. Sort yeah, of them. right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, I, that's I wonder, of, yeah. Yeah, like what what do, what do you feel like those guys think of you? Like, do you encounter a lot of like? Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't. Yeah, I don't really spend any time wondering, you know, what people think of. I just kind of do my thing. Uh, but now, I mean, now I remember what you know the other part of your question. But yeah, it, like the comic hipsters. It it it. it I um, American Barbarian was kind of around the time that there was like a like a shift um, in terms of where it, like seeing you know, uh, less of sort of like the, the, the old school Kirby fans who were just kind of like looking for more Kirby and then kind of like, like you just like, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I can't off the top of my head think of a better term than like sort of comic hipsters, but it was definitely the audience got younger and, uh, you know, uh, less male. And, you know, like it, it was, um, you know, it, it, it felt like that sort of started like a broadening of my audience and then state and soldier for whatever reason, even more so. Um, I, I think like the aesthetic of it just sort of resonated with, you know, some of the things that were going on just in sort of like independent comics and, uh, you know, sort of uh, it had, you know, sort of like a pseudo risograph aesthetic, which I think, you know, just it was kind of accidental. But I think that, um, you know, it kind of, you know, was part of that movement. And then with um, with Transformers versus G.I. Joe, I mean, um, they were really asking for like just full on Jack Kirby uh, Transformers and G.I. Joe, like they want like 100 percent. And like that was always going to be an ingredient just because I was it. But I was like, I like I don't think that's the like, I think it's like this other thing of like 
a sort of, um, you know, sort of, uh, um, you know, independent comics, like, like not independent comics, like what they were in the eighties or in the nineties, but like sort of like the independent comics of, you know, this moment or at least, or that moment it's, it's, it's been a few years since then, but, um, and, and so like, I felt like that was sort of the way forward. So, so a little bit of Jack Kirby, but then a little bit of this sort of, you know, other aesthetic. Yeah. And it's, it's, um, you know, to liken it to another music thing, it's like Dylan goes electric, you know, or like uh, I was super into rockabilly in my teens and twenties. And if any band went from the upright to an electric bass, it was like grounds for termination. You no longer wanted to be a fan of those bands or a lot of people did, but then the people that hung out would be like, Oh, wow. Okay. I see where you're going. So you kind of, you get the weirder fish in the deeper water as David Lynch used to talk about. Um, and the one other question, if I could, I, um, and it's also Kirby related. Um, I have this um, little sack of guilt that I carry around with me. And I've found that a lot of people have this too. A lot of other comic book people do that are around this age uh, in that when they saw Kirby as they were, when they were kids, they didn't quite dig them. They weren't quite, they didn't quite know to make heads or tails of Kirby. And I've talked to so many people who will kind of have this confessional moment where they'll be like, when I was a kid, I really didn't like, I didn't like Kirby, but I, I do now. <laughs> Did you have that? Or were you always just like right on no attraction, revulsion, pure attraction well, with your experience? I mean, like I, I relate to, like sometimes when you're talking to somebody like who's, who's like older than us um, and they like just don't get they don't, they don't understand Kirby past, you know, 1968 or whatever. I and I could kind of relate to that a little bit because like when I was a kid, it's like the, you know, Kirby Inc. by Coletta, you know, Kirby Inc. by Sinnott, those, you know, that there, there was like a softening that his marble work got, but then his seventies work, when you have Royer inking, there was like a little moment where I started to discover that stuff. And I was kind of like, uh, you know, I enjoyed it or whatever, but it, I was kind of like, oh, like everybody's got weird teeth, like they have like a mouth guard in or like it, there, there is an adjustment to kind of get into that aesthetic and then just, and, and you know, and, and of course it wasn't long before all those things that kind of struck me as weird or, or uncomfortable, like I sort of, you know, like fell in love with, but yeah, like Kirby to me, like aesthetically, um, like the raw Kirby, the Royer Inc. Kirby was not a natural fit. There's sort of other, when I was, you know, a kid and stuff, there were other artists who were more illustrative, more soft focus that just, um, I just had like an immediate connection to where with Kirby, it's like the big picture. It's like, it was just the, the myth making, the storytelling, the power, all this stuff kind of helped me to look past the things that, you know, bothered me. But then once I, you know, went through the looking glass, all those things that bothered me didn't bother me. In fact, they, they became my favorite thing. Yeah, I like to think of it as a case of uh, uh, the best taste for those acquired, right? Sure, yeah. Yeah, yeah. that 70s Kirby, and this is the last thing I'll say, I don't wanna take up any more time, but that 70s Kirby is very divisive among a lot of the older heads. Like, that, uh, yeah, that, know, and, and that, that moment has come and gone because yeah. when I first started making comics, that's all I would meet is like people who were like, oh, that, you know, 70s stuff. And then it seems like over the years, this like turning point happened where like you talk to somebody who's in their 20s, in their 30s, and it's like they are like 70s Kirby all the way. And like, oh, that 60s stuff is so talky and 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 milk toast, you know, by yeah. comparison, you know. Stan Lee it out, you know. Right. Like, uh, and, you know, he, he took over Cap again after Steve Englehart had a run. And like the people that were reading that at the time are like it went from being this this heady thing to just being this LSD nightmare, which, you know, give me the LSD nightmare. Good stuff. Thanks so much for talking. I really appreciate it. I'm going to hang on the line. Thanks, Rocco. And again, I put Rocco's Thank you, info there. You can check him out at ghostagents.net. And uh, maybe we have a Kickstarter starting up kind of soon. All right. We've got Victor coming up next. What up, Victor? Well, uh, hello, uh, uh, Tom. Sorry, nervous kid. You know, uh, glad to have you, man. Uh, 
have you ever thought about working with some of the like Simon and Kirby characters, you know, a uh, stunt man fighting American, those weird half knockoffs? For sure. I mean, I would, I would love it. Um, yeah, fighting American. I think he's got like one of the best costumes in comics. Uh, yeah, that would be amazing. Stunt man is, you know, that's, that's like as good as a superhero comic is going to get free, like 1960s Marvel, Jack Kirby, Stan Lee, Steve Ditko. That's like as good as a comic's going to get like um, th those late era Simon and Kirby things. They were, they were really like coming into their own in a big way. And it's a shame that sort of the, this like sort of mini collapse of the comics industry ended that. So I would love all that. And then, you know, there are, you know, uh, after doing, um, uh, the uh, Solar Legion, the Jack Kirby Star Warriors. There are other Simon. There are Simon and Kirby things that are um, in the public domain too. So it is tempting. You know, it, it is tempting to do like a Blue Bolt. Like I love Blue Bolt, um, and and it, it is tempting. Again, uh, same as with the Jack Kirby Star Warriors. I would want to, you know, make sure everything's square between me and the. Uh, Kirby family, and in this case, the, the Simon, in the case of Blue Bolt, it would be the Simon family too. I'd wanna to make sure that all that stuff's square before, even though it is public domain, I'd still wanna, you know, make sure that they're, you know, sort of taken care of in the equation too. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Victor. Uh, Tom, would you re remix the comics like you did for Star Warriors, or would you use them as a jumping off point, find new, adventures or yeah i i um like this star warriors thing was a very special case where i thought the the original material was so strong and if if you could just kind of you know peel away a couple of, and just kind of present it in the right light it, it, it would be like a revelation so i i don't see anything else like that so yeah if i were to do like a i mean i don't i don't think fighting americans in the in the public domain or something. But if I were to do like another, you know, like a, another okay. solo Jack Kirby or a Simon and Kirby uh, kind of, you know, public domain remix or whatever, um, it, it would be like, you know, I'd want to do like a, you know, like a wholly original story using those characters. But yeah, you never know. I mean, this this was a lot of fun. So, and, and I wasn't, I was aware of Solar Legion, but it didn't, it didn't quite speak to me until very recently. Uh, and so maybe there's another thing that I've, kind of been taking for granted or looking at all these years and didn't quite, you know, connect with its greatness that, that that's just sitting there waiting for me. That's awesome. Yeah. I, it's truly amazing what you did with this book, but uh, I don't want to jump in out of turn. We got the maker himself coming up next, Dave Hallett, amazing creator and uh great dude. What up, Dave? Hey, uh, hey, uh, hey, Tom. Uh, great to meet you. Huge fan. Uh, I read the new book last night. I got to take it home a day early because I'm a retailer. And uh, I got to say, it was one of my favorite reads of the year. I thought, uh, I'm talking about Star Warriors here, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> I read Stanley last week and I love that too. But Star Warriors was uh, just such a great experience. Wow. Just such a, like the, the color choices and the format. It just, uh, I don't know, it just felt like it really did feel like it was coming from another era. It was like this weird transmission through time. And I just thought it was just an incredible read. So, uh, and I just love that format that you chose, the thicker paper, like that just felt like such a great physical object. So I just want to say uh, thanks for, you know, taking that extra step to make it just an all around terrific package. Um, but my question is how much, uh, was there a lot of redrawing done? So I don't think it was just a matter of rearranging the panels. Like it seemed like maybe you had to recreate some stuff. Like were you, uh, I mean, it, it depends on your definition of drawing. I mean, it was it was a lot of, there was sort of like the rearranging stage of like sort of moving things around. And then it's more like just, it was, even though it doesn't look like ink, it's still kind of like digital inking. It was almost like I like re-inked the stuff, but but inked it with a pencil line rather than an ink line. So, um, you know, there, there was really just a small amount of sort of, additive or changing in the margins i really uh i mean it, it, it it's uh extremely true to what uh you know what kirby laid down i to me it's it's um the closest thing i've done to sort of 
um, like an illuminated manuscript or something. Like it was a very monastic work. I felt like it was, you know, like just sort of, I, I have this holy book uh, and I need to sort of, uh, you know, preserve it by recreating it and, and, and stuff. And, and uh, yeah, so it was like, it, it's, it's, it's all Kirby. Like it's, it's the, it, it, the Kirby stuff is just all there. I just kind of, I get like, just, you know, sprinkled some magic dust on it or whatever. It, it, and, and uh, like you're describing, like I, um, you know, it's just such a, it's a different reading experience, even, you know, if you compare it with the original, original book. And um, I, I didn't really have this thought until like it showed up, like, cause I, you know, as I was working on it, I obviously reading it, rereading it. But when it showed up to me as a comic, I was kind of like, this might be my favorite Jack Kirby comic ever. Like it just like, uh, you know, all these great com Jack Kirby comics I've read, like they all deserve that kind, like not necessarily like a re redraw or, or a recomposing, but like, you know, if th the thing I would like would be if they took Jack Kirby's unused on the road to Armageddon, his unused New God story that he did, you know, prior to, um, the Hunger Dogs, like if they made a presentation like that, where it's it's not part of like a expensive hardcover, it's not, it's just the most, you know, sort of beautifully produced uh, comic book that, you know, modern technology is capable of. Like I'd, I'd love more, because I love the comic book. And that was, that was kind of important to me to, to make this like really just kind of comic book as, as like fine art object, you know. It must have felt on some degree almost like a like you really were collaborating with Kirby. It must have been wild. Like it, uh, I don't know. I felt like I could see it was almost like this transparency. I could see your work laid over his in a weird way, and uh, just a really unique reading experience. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I, I mean, I was so happy with that work and so proud of it. But it it is like a where it's hard to kind of put your finger on it. You know, it's not it's not you know it's it, I get it like there's there's really nothing like it. Like like no you know no nobody's done you know exactly that kind of thing at least in comics there might be sort of like film equivalents or music equivalents but but in in comic books you know it, it was hard to find something to compare it to but uh, yeah i'm just so excited about that that project and, and i was so glad just to just have a copy for myself because i kind of had this vision of what kind of comic those solar legion stories could be and and to like actually have it now what you know is really exciting um it, yeah, I know. I loved it. I thought it was fantastic. And uh, if I may quickly ask too, is there any chance the myth of eight opus is ever going to be reprinted? Because that's one of your works I don't have and I'd love to get my hands on it. Yeah, I mean, I'm working on it currently. I'm working on like a color version of it, you know, colorizing it. Um, and, and I was also kind of like, I want to do, I want to put out a color version that really is just, you know, the original, because I think, you know, there are a lot of people who want to get it and just can't because it, it you know, it was, uh, you know, like a small print run and everything. So I want to make one that that is like the original comic, but in color. But I also thought like, you know, if I can, you know, remaster a comic that like Jack Kirby did when he was 22, like, why can't I remaster a comic that I did when I was young? So, but I, again, like, I, th I think, I think people do want like that original warts and all kind of like, you know, like a young artist figuring things out. Like there's, there's a real appeal to that. I think people want that but I, I think, you know, it would also be kind of cool to do like a remastered version also as companion pieces. So, I mean, you know, maybe, maybe image, maybe some publisher would be interested, but again, it does, it does feel like the ideal project for like a, like a, you know, crowdfunded kind of thing to where, you know, it's like, you know, thinking of like, you know, Jim Rugg with his uh, Octobriana where it's like, okay, here's this version of Octobriana. Here's that, like however many versions he feels like making, you know, he, he made and, and like, I, I would enjoy making, you know, just sort of the color version and uh, a remaster. That'd be very exciting. Uh, thanks so much, Tom. This is great. Uh, yeah, I'd love the Stan Lee book as well. Uh, that's quite a one-two punch. Uh, anyway, thanks again. Thank you so much, Dave. And again, I put Dave's link for the makers to the Cosmic Lion site in the chat as well. All right, we're heading back over to Adam Lemna, the Valley Connor himself. Uh -oh. Hey man. Um, so question that I have. All right. Um, I follow you on Patreon. I love your total recall show. One of the things that I loved finding on your Patreon was princess. 
and it sort of exists in this really like interesting space for me that's sort of like an intersection of like movies and comics and pulp magazines and all that sort of thing and I was just curious if you had like plans to do more because I think it's like I love the way that it looks I think it's really it reads really well it's really like it's like your style your style of like something like drawing something so I'd love to see more of it that's sort of like yeah <laughs> you know yeah I mean I I love princess and it was um when uh superpowers was done I was like I have all this you know creative energy that was just kind of getting started so princess was like a way to kind of take some of that creative energy from superpowers and start okay just start making my next thing just start making it and I made princess um there's you know 40 some pages of it and it's it's yeah, yeah ready to print and it it was pretty close to coming out there was uh you know there was like a whole you know deal and stuff kind of figured out with IDW to do it but then around that time there was a lot of personnel changes and, and a lot of and so like you know the people that I, I was talking to at, at uh, IDW with it uh you know weren't weren't there anymore and stuff and so it kind of fell by the wayside and I you know started work on the Jack Kirby book and sure. so then that kind of you know you know awesome. took over but but yeah Princess is there and um like I had planned it as an ongoing so uh, you know if anybody wants to do uh, if anybody watching this or you know, wants to do princess i would love to make that my you know sort of next you know big ongoing project but but yeah i'm, I'm really, really proud it. of that work i absolutely love it man i you know i it makes me think of like edgar rice burroughs it makes me think of star wars it makes me but it's also like completely its own thing and i love the character design itself because it's like manga ish but also like it almost is like children's story book look to it and and it's i don't know i think it's really powerful i think it's such a cool story man so uh thank you i, I really do hope to see it did i hear you're looking for a publisher for that tom or i'm looking for a publisher for, like anybody wants to publish any of that patreon stuff i am good to get like it's kind of like uh you know like that kind of fantasy make-believe sci-fi superhero stuff um, that's kind of a tough sell in general, but like a story about Jack Kirby, a story about uh, Stan Lee or whatever, much easier. It's much easier to get a publisher like ready to go with that, you know, but, but I mean, th that's my first love is all that sort of, you know, fantasy, make-believe, sci-fi kind of stuff. That's what I got into comics for in the first place. And uh, Star Warriors is kind of like the first comic of that type that, that I've been able to get, you know, into print with a publisher since Fantastic Four Grand Design. That was like the last time I kind of got to do, you know, that kind of like just, you know, you know, pure goofball stuff. Wow, damn. Uh, expect an email from Cosmic <laughs> Productions after this, sir. All right, cool. Thanks, man. All right, we got Victor, and then we got a special question from Shelly. What up, Victor? Uh, not much... Uh... Do you remember how uh, in the Superman and his pal Jimmy Olsen, there was the whole redrawing Kirby's faces? Have you ever thought about doing sort of a bit with that and having someone else redraw faces for one character in a project? I, I, I mean, I, I, you know, I see how that could be like an interesting storytelling technique, and they did, um, they did that with. Uh, Supreme when Alan Moore was writing Supreme and they did uh, it was called New Jack City where they go to sort of like a Jack Kirby land and Rick Veach drew the whole comic in a Jack Kirby style and then um, you know as part of the design Alan Moore had Rob Liefeld draw the Superman faces for exactly that effect but yeah it, it seems like it could be an interesting storytelling technique maybe even like peeling you know, having it get like unpeeled at a certain point because a lot of those, at least initially, were paste ups. Um, after a while, it was just like when they figured it out, it's like Coletta would just sort of leave, you know, the face uninked and then and then Murphy Anderson or whoever would come in and ink it. But in the beginning, they were paste ups. Um, and then just, yeah, j just like while we're talking about that topic, um, I, I, I have done a couple pages where I was trying to like, re-Kirbyfy some of those Superman faces, like the ones where we don't have 
um, a pencil photocopy because there are some where the pencil photocopies do exist, but there's some like Forever People Number One where so far that's not surfaced. Maybe it'll never surface. Uh, and so I did kind of take like one or two pages from there and just kind of like use all my, you know, Kirby imitating knowledge to try to like re Kirbyfy those things. Cause I, I love a, a Jack Kirby Superman. I mean, I, I, I think his Superman is just amazing. Absolutely, man. Thanks again for another good question, Victor. All righty. Let's go over to Shelly Bond. What up, Shelly? Hey, how are you guys doing? Tom? Always good. Amazing work. Eli, you're the best. All right, Tom, I have to say, loving this. <laughs> oh my God, not finished, but the Fellini page. <laughs> I know so little about mainstream comics, okay? I've learned everything that I care to remember about Marvel through your work and Jim Rugg and Ed's grand design and your Kirby book, astounding. Honestly, I, I, I feel so educated about Kirby. So this I'm loving as well. I had two questions for you. One, did you hand letter this book yourself? Because it's incredible. I do a bit of lettering, but I don't know if anyone has seen this, but this is like stunning. I don't do quite so good at, at hand lettering. What do you have a soundtrack for this book? Did, what were you listening well, to when you were drawing it? Yeah, I, I, yeah. To answer your first question, I hand lettered it. I've hand lettered, you know, the past few projects I've worked on, and it is, you know, speaking of Jim Rugg uh, and and uh, his his on air partner Ed Pisker. When I first met those guys, they were so big on hand lettering. And to me, that was like a joke. I thought, like, I thought like, oh, well, computers have made that, like, why would you waste your waste time that you could be better spent drawing? Why would you waste it on lettering? But yep. they really made a believer out of me where it's yes. like, oh yeah, like That's your me. eye is spending a lot of time looking at those words. And if they look like shit, the, the reader's looking at shit. So make, you know, make, you know, invest the time. In, and, and so now I'm a, a believer and, and yeah, I got a hand letter, all my stuff. So it is hand lettered. And it was interesting, like doing a Stan Lee story where it's like, he's not an artist, he's a writer. And so that was a lot of fun sort of playing and, and having, you know, pseudo typewritten lettering and, you know, and, and like the lettering, like the lettering became kind of a star in, in like Stan Lee's story. Um, and then in terms of music, I mean, I think just just sort of, you know, uh, uh, knowing uh, a little bit about you and your work, I, I think we have a lot of the same tastes. So uh, musically, so I do, you know, listen to a lot of uh, Bowie and um, I like, I like the Beatles. I like, the, I like British invasion stuff. I like uh, T-Rex. I like, I like the sort of glam era and stuff. Um, so, I mean, I was definitely listening to a lot of that. And then um, when I was doing um, when I was doing the Transformers versus G.I. Joe, I was listening to Lou Reed's Transformer, like just, just being like very literal. And of, then I was- Of course, you would have yeah. to. Now, seriously. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. E even the rock and roll animal might've been nice to, to like bounce back and forth, you know, from those two, but how cool is that? Yeah, and, and, and then the other thing, which, which is maybe, maybe not quite as much in the same world as some of those other things, just because of like the G.I. Joe aspect, I was listening to a lot of ACDC when I was working on that too. Cause just like, a bow, 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 like it just felt very kind of like, uh, you know, snarly and, and, and stuff that, that like I thought, you know, fit well for like the GI Joes. And, and uh, yeah, that, that, I think that stuff kind of, you know, came out in, into the work. Amazing. Thank you so much. Thanks Shelly. And uh, please check out all of Shelly's uh, work as well. You can check it out online. She's got a brand new zine. And what's the website again? Uh, dot what? It's off if off register dot press. And since everybody here is so good at self promoting, I will hold up the new zine. We just got it printed. It's called Angst Farm. But don't buy it for anything I do in it. Buy it because. Philip Bond 
is the one of the greatest artists on planet earth my favorite artist and he did something called rewired world which is basically he redrew some panels from his very first series for deadline that i think he did in 1988 because he's very old mm -hmm. and i'm three months younger <laughs> but don't tell anybody all right, thank you so much. I put the links down in there. Shelly's got an amazing editing class as well. If you're interested in stepping up your game a little bit. Uh, I saw Victor maybe had another question, but he's out. So let's, uh, we'll come back to you, Victor. Let's go back to Manny here. We've got about 24 minutes left. So let's check in with Manny. Uh, I was wondering if you wanted to talk about, I mean, what comes next? I mean, you, you just came off a really big project, you know, with the Stan Lee, and then you came off of like a, what you said is a very kind of unique project with the, uh, with the, uh, the Kirby book. So, uh, I mean, not maybe specifically what's next, but what would you like to do next? Something different, you know, like in, in tone or in genre? I mean, are you in that mindset yet? Or, I mean, I, I do like, I've done two, um, like two comics biographies in a row. Right. And, um, you know, I could, I could do another one, you know, that, uh, you know, but I, I mean, I, I really like, again, I, I really love escapism. I love, you know, fantasy, science fiction, I was, you know, action, adventure, superheroes. Um, and, uh, but even though I was kind of, you know, facilitating Jack Kirby's vision with uh, Jack Kirby's Star Warriors, um, that did even given that like, that still did kind of help give me a little bit of like a little bit of a hit of like oh yeah doing like just sort of you know pure like spaceships and robots and monsters and stuff. But I I mean the thing I'm really pushing for as my next book, and it's just a matter of if um, you know some other project of mine maybe like you know wins out or whatever. But but the thing I'm really pushing for is. Um, I've been working for and it's working on and it's been on my Patreon and stuff and I've posted some of it, uh, you know, just elsewhere too, but it's um, the Scarlet Letter Part 2. Um, it's, uh, you know, this sort of uh, like a continuation of the story of Pearl Prin, who was, you know, the baby in uh -huh. uh, the Scarlet Letter. Um, it's and it's got action adventure, it's got like monsters and demons and uh, you know, uh, you know, pilgrim hats and stuff like it's just it's so much fun and so cool. It again, that's a tougher sell with a, like you know. It seems like uh, you know publishers are generally more interested in uh, you know stuff that's maybe a little less crazy. But I, uh, you know, I I really like doing sort of crazy comics. So so that that would be my preferred you know next project but i mean there's a whole bunch of things i've been working on like creator and stuff i've been working on that that again like if 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 you know the right publisher were interested I'd, I'd be all about it but um and then and then yeah i have this like work for hire project that um you know is gonna it, it, you know it's supposed to come out um at at the end of 2024 but i mean it feels like a long way away but it's um i'm sure it'll be here before you know, know it just like I can't, I can't believe we're like this far into september you know so i'm yeah. sure all right, thank you. Cool, thanks, Manny. All right, let's go back over to Dave Hallett. He's got his hand back up. What up, Dave? Hey, uh, yeah, I just wanted to add my voice to the chorus of praise for Transformers versus G.I. Joe, which I just reread two weeks ago and uh, wild. I don't know how anybody's even doing Transformers or G.I. Joe comic books after that because I, I feel like you covered it all. Um, but I realized, like, I've got the issues and there was a big omnibus hardcover from IDW, the three trade paperbacks. I believe they're all out of print right now. Do you know, if, is Skybound going to be able to reprint any of that stuff? Like, it would be great to have that back out on the shelves again. I mean, they they are the rights holders. And yeah, if if they want to get this stuff back in print, uh, they got my vote. You know, I'm, I'm all in favor of that. And um, I mean, I think, you know, it's issue one of, of their new, you know, Transformers and G.I. Joe books and, what, and whatever hasn't even come out yet. So I'm sure they got their hands full with that. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm ho I haven't heard anything, but I'm hoping they'll, they'll, you know, get around to reprinting that. And then even uh, if they were interested in, um, in Transformers versus G.I. Joe, I teased, it was, you know, back in like 2014 or whatever, but I, it, it, within those pages, I teased 
uh, a comic, a, a Transformers versus GI Joe mini series about shipwreck to come out in 2025, which seemed like an impossibly distant future shipwreck year. Space Pirate, I think it was. <laughs> yes, shipwreck space pirate. So I'm assuming I'm assuming they're still going to have the rights in 2025. So if they want to if they want to bring me back for that and take that thing, which was you know kind of a joke, but but kind of half joking, and turn it into like less of a joke. And more of a real thing, you know. I'd, I'd, I'd be up for. That. I'm up for whatever. I love making comics, and if I'm not being paid to make comics, I'm still making comics. If I'm being paid to make comics, even better. But I'm 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 here to make comics. So you know, anybody who wants to make a comic with me, and especially getting it into print, because I love print. I love, I love you know. I I'm I'm all about digital and experimentation. But like, print is my first love. So. I think the love shows on the page. Thanks again, Tom. All right. Thank you, Dave. All right. We're going to go to Victor and then we're going to go back over to Rick. What up, Victor? I know this is probably the most cliche question possible. Do you have any advice for a young guy trying to do this? You know, <laughs> I, just general advice. I mean, yeah. yeah, it's it's like from my point of view, it's it's like so easy to say this stuff, but it's like just like be pr as prolific as possible. Uh, just get your stuff out there, um, you know, in whatever form you can, you know, uh, digitally. Uh, uh, like, and I'm sure you're doing all the, you know, you know, all the things. We're probably even doing things I wouldn't think of, but yeah, just like get it out there and. Um, you know, and just, you know, kind of be true to your voice again, because, and, and I had this feeling and, and part of like me working in a Kirby mode was like me addressing some like insecurities of when I was first starting out, I thought, who cares about what I have to say? Like, who am I? What, what does anybody care? Uh, and so I, you know, working in a Kirby mode was kind of like, okay, well, people might care about it because it's, you know, because I'm, I'm, you know, working in a Kirby mode or, you know, like, I, but looking back, it's like, you know, so like, like a young artist wants to be an old artist and an old artist wants to be a young artist. Right? Like when somebody new comes onto the scene, like artists who, who are in the scene, you know, whether they admit it or not, are kind of like, Ooh, what's this? You know, like, I haven't seen this, be you know, like, it's like, like a new talent who's got a completely different vision is like, it's so exciting to like, you know, to, to the industry, to, to editors and, and artists and writers. And, it, and, and so like, you know, lean into that aspect of your work, lean into the things you're doing that nobody else is doing. But I mean, just the biggest thing is just don't quit. That was, that was kind of like uh, advice that I got early on was just kind of like, just that people just kind of stick around. And if you just keep, no matter what, just keep getting up and doing that next thing and, and, and kind of, you know, keeping that smile on your face, uh, no matter what kind of, you know, bad thing comes your way. Like it, it is a, a war of attrition in a lot of ways. And it's like, and, you know, like, like I just kind of stuck around and I, I, I just kept, you know, kept getting up and, you know, despite any kind of like frustrations that might've happened along the way. So like, I, I think that's the most important thing, like, you know, is, is just, you know, the ability to just keep going. I also feel you on the, uh, you know, Kirby energy thing. Uh, there was this anthology, it was going to be the first thing I had published that fell through. Uh, I just randomly saw an issue of Godlands and had this beautiful six page Kirby project together. It was all ready to be published. Everything just gets ruined, you know, sort of how comics were mm -hmm. thanks victor you ought to join us for our first saturday of the month ringside thologies when we all get together and draw on a theme um i yes i forgot it this month it is a busy month next month we'll definitely do it let's think about october 7th would be a perfect time so mark that on your calendar we'll do ringside thology again then Maybe we can uh, do uh, auto bio comics this time and honor Joe Matt. That would be sweet. All right, man. Thank you so much. All right, let's go over to Rick again. And uh, what you got, Rick? Thanks again, Tom. 
uh we all love gi joe versus transformers i I know i loved it um but i'm curious like how was it working with hasbro was like was there pushback on any of the ideas that you wanted to do or did they just let you run free with whatever you wanted because i mean on my end that's what it seemed like but i don't know if like there was even because i know you have really big ideas i don't know if they're stopping some of the bigger ideas yeah i mean i went into that with the idea of like i'm just gonna go for broke, do it, like do it all. And then if they don't like it, they can tell me and I'll fix it or whatever. Uh, But I was just going to go for it. And um, there there was some like initial pushback in the beginning. And again, I like, it was just, they they didn't really know me, but having John Barber there really helped because he, he had a long running relationship with Hasbro up to that point. And so he was able to sort of, you know, run in interference with them and maybe if they were, you know, and, and advocate and things. So I just, I just kept sort of pushing because I, I just had this vision of what this thing could be. And I just, like, I, I had to do it without limit. So I just pushed it, but I also understood that it was very possible that I could get fired, you know, that the whole thing could be over. And, and I sort of made peace with that idea. And once I made peace with that idea, it was, you know, I just kind of did, and I didn't get fired. <laughs> like I got to do Every single thing I set out to do with that, I got to do. And then um, when I when I did um, superpowers after that, I took that same approach. Uh, but that time my, my luck wasn't as good, so I did get fired. Uh, you know, off of that. But it was like I thought, like man, I found the way to do this stuff, and it was. And then I was a little bit like cautious after that of like, uh, you know, like this this isn't. Uh, uh, you know, this isn't as, as uh, you know, I, I, I realized how lucky I was with the Hasbro thing to be able to uh, to do all that. I, I think that, um, you know, it's just sort of a difference in, in culture between DC and Hasbro and, 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 you know, and that Hasbro isn't really in the comics business. You know, they're in the toy business and this comics thing is like a nice little side thing that they do. They do have some concerns and cares about this and that, but they're not where like DC, they are in the comics business. So they were much more, um, like it, it was so, sort of the most restrictive uh, uh, editorial environment I've ever experienced in comics was at DC at that time. Uh, there's been a lot of turnover since then. So I don't know if, if that's still the case, but it was, uh, you know, when I was there. I mean, for the record, uh, Superpowers is fucking awesome. That was the whole reason I bought Cape Carson. So yeah, thanks, Tom. I appreciate you, dude. All righty, let's go back over to Mr. Relic Hunting Adam Lemna himself. Hey, Tom. Um, Merry Christmas. So building off of what Shelly asked you earlier, um, and this is kind of a two-part question. What's on the to-read pile for you right now? Uh, what's in the to-watch pile? Because I love watching your film reviews. I think they're fantastic. Um, and I love your I love your perspective on films. And so taking it one step further, like Matthew Allison posted something maybe like a year and a half ago, sort of a rant about, um, you know, comics don't need to be films to be taken seriously. And I think that that's a really powerful sort of thing. And I'd love to know where you sort of stand on the whole like legitimacy of comics versus legitimacy of movies and in terms of the way that people see things Mm -hmm. and like, uh where you stand you know would you ever like to see any any of your comics made into films would you want to make them as a filmmaker do you have any desire to do that sort of thing and uh yeah so what are you what are you what's on the to read pile to watch pile and then further yeah i mean um like doing these sort of comics reviews has sort of taken care of a lot of my reading list because it is like okay, you know, I'm, I'm reading a lot of, you know, Jack Kirby New Gods. I'm reading a lot of Micronauts. Uh, I'm reading a lot of things. Um, so, yeah, I, I um, you know, I'm always on the lookout for, for new stuff, too. And it's, it's been a while. It's been a couple of weeks since last time I went to the comic store. So, you know, I, I you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sure I'll find something, uh, something there. In terms of movies, uh, again, like, you know, we, we did an episode about Superman three and then it was kind of like, okay, we did that. Let's do Superman 
four. <laughs> and know, I love like, that too because Superman <laughs> four is such a, a movie that everybody shits on. So it sure. was really great to see you guys like, okay, is this good or is it not good? Let's let's give it a chance. Well, because yeah, I I shit on it myself uh, because <laughs> I remember when it came out in in like 1987, and I I could not have been more done with yep. Superman like the Superman movie series at that time. And I just, I saw it once on VHS and it wasn't even like, I was like, oh, you know, mom and dad, let's let's rent this. Like they rented it for them. And I just, and I'm like, uh, you know, rolling my eyes and stuff. And then, yeah, so this was the second time I saw it and I loved it. You know, it, you know it's just the difference between, you know, sort of a kid's taste and, and you know, a taste, uh, you know, well into adulthood. Um, and, and just in terms of movies, it is just kind of like whatever I'm in the mood for. Like I'm, I'm watching the Monster Squad right now because Halloween's coming. So I like to kind of, you know, sprinkle in some of that kind of stuff. So I'm watching the Monster Squad. And again, that was like another 1987 movie that I think I only saw the one, like I saw it in the theater. Um, I only saw it the one time. And so it's kind of fun watching that again. And, and just, um, you know, seeing something that's like pre-CGI and stuff. It, it's, you know, so much fun. Uh, and then, um, you know, just I, I've been getting into just silent movies lately. I get like this um, Jack Kirby Star Warriors, like looking at Jack Kirby's like, you know, just about his very first comic book. Um, it's it's making me like just really think about that in terms of like all popular culture of just like, let me check out these these early, early works, most of them that I haven't seen. And, um, you know, watching like Charlie Chaplin, watching The Gold Rush, watching Modern Times. Like these are these are amazing, uh, amazing totally. films and. Um... Yeah, I was just watching. Uh, it's like really hard. I have an eleven-year-old son. It's really hard to get him to watch like any movies because attention span is so short nowadays. It's like meme videos. That's what what he loves, you know. But I was watching uh, the other night. I was drawing and I was watching on the waterfront. And he came in and he laid down and he watched the entire film and he's asking me questions about it. And I was like what about on the waterfront would like connect with like an 11 year old it's so crazy but like they're taking it so seriously they feel so serious in the film and you're watching it and it be, it's you know I, there's something to that there's something to watching like the way that films were made and I think with with silent films that's so close to what is being done with comics I mean like the overlap there is so so close Whereas like now it's a little bit, I mean, it is still very close, but it's, it's not as close as it is. Like you can make a silent comic and you can make a silent film and they, you know, with the exception of like multiple images, it's almost exactly the same. Yeah. You have, and, and they are occupying like the same time and space too. Like you have, right. uh, you know, the Charlie Chaplin films at the same time as like EC Seeger is making Popeye or Thimble theater. And, um, uh, George Harriman is making Crazy Cat. So, th and 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 those those were almost like you know th there was there was vaudeville and things, but then it was also like oh, uh, it's it's like a comic strip, you know. It's it, you know, and 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 the visual language. There's so much commonality. Thanks, Tom. Uh, we fell asleep with TCM on last night, and uh, I was woken up in five a.m. by the greatest <laughs> dictator getting yelled at in German, and that was. <laughs> a bad introduction <laughs> to Charlie Chaplin, but I might give it another chance. We'll see. All right, let's head over to Tony Farrow. And uh, this may be the last question of the evening. I actually don't have a question. I have a quick, uh, just a recommendation because we were talking about things to read or whatever in this. Um, I don't know, um, Tommy, I don't know if, how much you pay attention to, you know, current comics coming out, especially mainstream comics or not um but i don't know if you're aware of the uh, there was a series that came out about a year ago i think called defenders beyond have you heard of this no okay i would highly recommend it it's one of those rare occurrences when marvel puts out something really good and uh i i i just thought of you because there's a character in that comic that's um it's actually galactus's mother and <laughs> she's her dialogue is written uh like Kirby's dialogue and the the writer did amaz an amazing job of capturing like the essence of Kirby's dialogue and uh it's just an interesting it'd be an interesting thing to check out and uh, 
the artwork is fantastic. I believe it's um, Javier Rodriguez, I believe, did it. It's fantastic. But just a, just a recommendation of a modern comic that you may have overlooked because most modern comics from Marvel are crap, but that's one of the good ones that stuck that stuck out recently. So worth checking out. Yeah, I, I, yeah, yeah I, I haven't seen that or heard of it, but I, I do like I do get excited when there is something kind of interesting that does come out of the mainstream and that, like I mean the, uh, the one that's coming to mind, and again, this is at this point many years ago, but like the um, the uh, Jason Aaron and Assad Ribic on Thor, like when that was first starting up, that was it was kind of an exciting thing. And then they made like you know a movie adaptation of it that didn't didn't quite live up to the source material. But but yeah, it, it, I love it when something really amazing comes out of uh, you know Marvel or DC or even you know you know some of the established stuff with the, which is what I was kind of shooting for with Transformers versus GI Joe and with GoBots, where it's like how great is it when something really interesting comes out of like you know kind of where you least expect it or where you know you would love something really cool that you know to come out of there. Absolutely. Totally agree. All right. Thank you so much, Tony. Oh, and yeah, that first issue looks like it's on Google Books. So I put the link there in the chat as well. Everyone, I want to thank you all so much for uh, joining us today for New Comic Book Day Night Live. It's been another amazing day. My cat is sniffing around in strange places. Anyway, don't jump. Okay. All right. And thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, it's been another amazing week for New Comic Book Day Night Live. So remember, don't just read more comics, be more comics. All right, y'all. Until next week, have a great one. Bye.